welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. We are back with our esteemed guest, scholar on the Middle East, Islam, and the Palestinian people, Robert Spencer. He's the founder and editor of Jihad Watch. He has a new book out that I urge you to go find on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Robert, welcome back. Great to be back, Barry. Thank you. Terrific. So we were talking in the last episode about Mahmoud Abbas, who was elected president of the Palestinian Authority in 2004. Uh, his term expired in 2008. For any of you that actually know, he's still the president of the Palestinian Authority. He has banned all elections and made himself dictator for life. Um, but he's getting old, and that life may not be long term. Uh, the adage in Israel is he's the president of the Palestinian Authority till they kill him or he dies. The obvious question is, what comes next? Obviously, Abbas does not want elections because when there were elections in the other Palestinian territory, the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians hated the Palestinian Authority so much they voted for Hamas, who promptly killed everybody that opposed them within the territory, banned all future elections as those types of wanton, violent dictators are prone to do. And the worry on the West Bank, where the Palestinian Authority is still in control, is if Abbas is gone and there's an election, are the Palestinians going to vote for Hamas just because they hate the corruption of the Palestinian Authority so much? Robert, what's your prediction? What comes next? I do think Hamas is likely to win an election in the West Bank and that they would uh, do the same thing that they did in Gaza. It's not even so much, I don't think, because the uh, people are upset about the corruption. Really, corruption is not something that uh, anybody can say that they're free of in this realm. You mentioned in the last segment, I believe it was, that Mahmoud Abbas is, is a multimillionaire. Well, you know, he doesn't have a trade. He doesn't have a business. He's been siphoning off aid money. But other multimillionaires in this realm are Khaled Mashal and Musa Abu Marzouk of, of Hamas, who also have been siphoning off aid money. And you know, the, the, neither the followers of Hamas nor the followers of Fatah, the Palestinian Authority's political arm, uh, the, the, neither of them, the, the PLO's political arm, that is, neither, neither of them really care about corruption. Nobody is standing up and saying, I'm going to reform candidate. Uh, I'm going to clean this government up. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, he says, you obey your ruler, even if he is an Ethiopian with a head like a raisin, which is an extraordinarily racist statement from the supposed great prophet. But it's, the, it's instructive in the sense that he's telling Muslims that they need to acquiesce to authoritarian regimes. And for the most part, that has become a cultural habit all over the Islamic world. It's why you don't see democracies in culturally Muslim countries. And this is why Mahmoud Abbas has been able to hang on to power, why Hamas has been hang able to hang on to power, and why Hamas would likely take over is more because they are so fanatically Islamic. And being fanatically Islamic is what is really popular in these areas. So uh, I do think that when Abbas dies, it is likely that there'll be civil strife, but probably Hamas will prevail. Well, that's, you're <clears throat> probably right, number one. And number two, that's terrifying because I've been all along those borders. Um, I've been all around the Gaza Strip and everywhere near the Gaza Strip uh, on the Israeli side is a live fire zone uh, from rifle fire, grenade launchers, uh, balloons with incendiary devices tied to them, Katusha rockets, uh, and longer range rockets, as you know. Fortunately, those weapons, for the most part, have not been lobbed over the security barrier from the West Bank into Israel proper. But I remember standing uh, on the roadside at the barrier, parallel to Tel Aviv, I could see from the border of Israel in the Jordan Valley, all the way to the Mediterranean with my eyes, no binoculars. 
And in my field of vision was the main power plant for Israel, which is just outside Tel Aviv, and the Ben-Gurion Airport. And if God forbid there was Hamas on the West Bank with those similar weapons, they could stop tourism into Israel with one grenade launcher that hit a plane landing or taking off. It's that serious. In other words, the land barrier that protects Israel, as we talked about in an earlier episode, uh, in the north with the Golan, in the far south with the Sinai, does not exist between the West Bank and Israel. One side of that barrier are Palestinians that may have bazookas or grenade launchers or making weapons that they can just throw up in the air and over the fence. And on the other side is a civilized people that doesn't shoot over the fence, even though they have more weapons than almost any country on earth. What do you believe, given that geography that you've seen, that I've seen, how is there going to be peace there? Well, I don't think this is, this is, there's going to be peace. I think this is the fundamental fallacy of all the peace negotiations. And this is one of the primary points of the book. There is not going to be peace. Americans don't want to hear this. Uh, people are used to television shows that wrap up the problem in half an hour or an hour. And uh, they think there's got to be a solution. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken around various places around the country and around the world for that matter. And people at the end of it, they think, oh no, this is such a downer. And they ask me, can't you give us any good news? What's the solution? And I tell them, we have to understand the problem as it is. I would love to be able to stand up here and tell jokes and make everybody happy, but we need to be informed about what the situation really is so that we can deal with it realistically and effectively. And the fact is this problem cannot be solved as long as there are people who believe that Allah is God and this is the Quran, is the prophetic book and Muhammad is the prophet, then they're gonna believe that they have to drive the Jews out of the land of Israel and destroy the state of Israel. So the problem can only be managed and it can be managed. That let's, is good news. Let's talk about a couple of ideas. I, <clears throat> when I was last in Israel, I did a couple of interviews with Dr. Martin Sherman. Um, he is of a mindset I was just reminded of it listening to you, Robert, in that you can't make peace with people who insist from the core of their being that they want and need to kill you. And his idea is you have to separate peoples like that. You can't have them in the same room, so to speak, especially in regards to the West Bank, that the territory of Israel uh, inside the Green Line, you know, the armistice from the War of Independence, which was supposed to be just a temporary secession of violence line that somehow in Europe ended up being the border, which must be honored. He wants the people separated because he says, without that, you'll never have peace. Are you familiar with his idea to pay Palestinians to relocate elsewhere? Yes, I am. And I think that they would readily take the money and then uh, come back. <laughs> uh, because the, the jihad imperative overrides every other consideration. If you are a pious, believing, and knowledgeable Muslim, then you're not going to make any kind of agreement with infidels, that you accept one that will redound to your own advantage. And so they may be paid, they may leave, but the jihad will go on. And what, we, what there needs to be, ultimately, the way the problem can be managed is only by uh, um, strength and societal self-confidence, that uh, Israel stops engaging in these self-defeating peace negotiations, negotiations, certainly welcomes any of the uh, Arabs who wish to renounce the jihad and live in peace in a genuine manner, with the Israelis as they already have. Uh, many, many Israeli Arabs, even in the Knesset, uh, although not all of them are actually loyal to the, to the state of Israel. But at the same time, standing firm and making it abundantly clear that this genocidal incitement is not gonna be tolerated in a way that it has been tolerated now for about 40 years. 
to, to nobody's benefit. Uh, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. I agree with you 100%. Thanks for joining us on ATP Report. And a special thanks to our esteemed scholarly guest, Robert Spencer, for joining us today. I want to remind everyone that they should text 88202, 88202, and put in the word truth in your message. It'll subscribe you to our text message service so you never miss an episode or any of our articles. You get it on a daily basis, and we never charge for content. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbaum.